Hello, I am Danielle Wozniak, Director of the School of Social Work, and I'd like to welcome you to our continuing um, artist talk series on art and social justice. Today, we are so lucky to have a community activist, healer, and social justice worker, um, and artist, did I say artist? Mm -hmm. Oh, good, um, Arla Patch. Uh, who will be joining us and talking about her work um, with um, incarcerated women, teens, um, people who have addiction issues, um, and people who are um, uh, dealing with physical issues like uh, women dealing with breast cancer. Um, so um, I um, would like to welcome Arla. Arla also is the author of two books that I believe that she'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you have questions, we'll pass the microphone around. It's not so much to amplify it for the room, but it's to amplify it for our tape. Welcome, Marla. Thank you very much, Danielle. I also really want to thank Kathy Plord, because she's really um, the contact person that I first met, and also Kat Gifford. And then, um, I guess I'm just going to chew this cough drop. Um, and then we have um, Catherine and Kathy. No, did I get it right? Kathleen, Kathleen and Kathy. So I thank all the cat, cat, cats. Um, there's a lot I'd really like to cover in this. I'm really taking a huge survey and putting it in a very short space. So I thought we could all do something because I need to do it. And it just helps allow information in. And it's to start on the front of your earlobes and massage them. Oh, I get goosebumps. All the way down to your earlobes and then all the way back. And it just kind of opens up so that you can really get a lot in, because I have a lot to cover. <laughs> uh, first of all, did everybody do the four slips? That was just four things of, of real great meaning to you in your life, and just to stash them for now, and then we'll pick them up later at the end. Um, I find it incredibly exciting that the power of art is coming into greater consciousness and awareness in so many disciplines. What was once considered very fringe is now valued. And going through my life as an artist, I have, it's always the artsy fartsy, you know, the, those people. Now what we've been doing seems to be important and counts. Um, brain research has a lot to do with this, which is very exciting because that becomes hard science. And neuroimaging is probably the most significant piece of evidence that we have, and it, and it validates what I've been witness. Hi, come on in. That's okay. Um, the thing that it validates is what actually I've been witnessing, and that is that it's a very successful way to access trauma and then help transform trauma. So um, before I show you an image, I just want to give you this one quote because I almost fell out of my chair when I read this. It's, if you don't go away with anything today, I hope you just go away with this one quote from Doris Bonofsky Arrington. And what she found and what she said was, creative activity literally changes the traumatized topography of the brain. I just, I mean, it still gives me the chills on my arms and my legs. Creative activity literally changes the traumatized topography of the brain. So this work that I've been doing now for a long time, I witnessed the change. Now I know the science is proving to us that it is making change. And the other thing I know from my own recovery, and I, it's important to know I do have a, a trauma history that gave me the opportunity to do the work myself. Um, and this one I know firsthand, and many of you can probably relate to it. The rational left brain often creates a matrix of protection by minimizing. And the left brain is so rational, it's so good at minimizing and denying. And it, it protects us. And I think there are times in our lives when we need that protection. I think that protection's great. I mean, as a child, I'm glad I had that protection. And it wasn't until I was 36 before I was actually ready to uh, deal with my own history. So the first image that I want to show you, um, actually, if it was 600 years ago, I would have been burned at the stake because it was a vision. I woke up one morning and I saw this woman with her arms outstretched and she was made out of ferns. And I was like, wow, that is a gift. You need to, um, you need have, you need to grab onto that and figure that out. 
And I, as being a photographer, I knew that I could take a slide. I knew I could project a slide. And I knew that I could get in front of that because I taught art history for many years and the kids would always put their hands in the paintings. And one time I said, okay, let's just do that. And I got a kid up there and I focused a, a portrait painting on him and it was very cool and everybody was loving it. And so I knew I could get the image to actually focus. So this f woman of ferns was the first image that I made. And when the slides came back and I realized it worked, she looked like she was made out of ferns. I went on to do 19 of those images, and that's what's in my first book, which is called A Body Story. Now, the thing about this is there, and, I, and I'm not, I didn't time this talk, so I'm going to try to just really quickly, in a nutshell, tell you an important story connected to this, because the motivation to do the book came at the same time that this wonderful <laughs> gift from Creator came to me of the woman made out of ferns. And what happened was I had a, um, a fibroid tumor show up, and it showed up really dramatically with hemorrhaging and throwing up and all kinds of stuff. And I went into the ER, and actually I realized right away that I couldn't afford that, so I went out, and I was still in my PJs, and was driven to Portland so I could go to my gynecologist. Or I'll make the story shorter. Anyway, she told me I had a baseball-sized fibroid tumor, and I couldn't afford the um, sonogram, so it took me six months to save up for that. In those six months, I went through a spiritual awakening in a sense because I felt invaded, first of all, that I had a tumor. And then I realized, no, 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 this is not an invasion. This is a sage. This is the teacher who's come to teach you. So my mantra or prayer, if you will, was would you be willing to shrink as I learn the lessons you came to teach me? And in that period of time, I started to see it as a walnut. Well, lo and behold, I had the sonogram and the doctor sat down and he told me how big it was in centimeters. And I said, is that the size of a walnut? And he said, yes, exactly. And the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I heard the choir of angels. And I was like, oh, my God, it's real. And that's when I wanted to do the book. So that's really the story behind this one. Um, this process of taking nature and fusing it with my body, I came to call the nature fusion process. And as I said, it led to 19 images that are in the book. This one was actually in um, the Harvard Divinity School in a show. Um, and there's the book. Um, one of the things about this that happened to me as a form of healing, and I want to just, this is one of the modalities that I have used with others also, and that's what the second book is, is sharing this modality with other people. But the thing that I want to explain about it is I didn't know at the time the simple equation that it was going to create. And that equation was, is that if I can see the sacredness of nature, which I certainly could from the time I was tiny and a little girl crawling up in trees and holding on, I mean, it's always been sacred to me. I could see the sacredness in nature as having a challenge understanding it in myself because of the abuse. But if I fused with it, and I saw myself fused with nature, the equation is I had to see the sacredness in myself. And it worked for me, and then I thought maybe it would work for women in prison or these at-risk girls that I uh, worked with in Arizona at a uh, therapeutic boarding school. So um, that, then this is one of the girls in the therapeutic boarding school. Now, what's interesting is um, it was run by Mormons, and at first, I uh, had them wearing like uh, tank tops and things like that, and sometimes t-shirts. In fact, there's one that's um, uh, in the collection of UNE that the girl has a t-shirt on, I think, and I have that, I'll show you. Um, but I got smarter later and realized that I could get leotards, and they were a lot easier. But with the magic of Photoshop, um, I was able to take her tank top out so you don't see that. Because obviously, with me and my own privacy of my home and with one person behind the camera, na nakedness was not a problem. But to go into a prison or to go into a, girls, a Mormon girls' boarding school, um, I definitely needed that. Uh, see, that, there's the t-shirt. Now, the thing that's actually good about the t-shirt is this is a light green leaf. And we don't see the green anywhere except on the t-shirt. So in a sense, it's kind of um, wonderful. And this young woman um, had been living in the streets, was a heroin addict, and had really had a really tough life, and um, was just amazingly creative and wonderful. You'll see one of her drawings in one of the other modalities. Um, this one is actually owned by Anne Zill, and um, 
this woman has, I don't know if you can see it, but in the medium security prison, they were allowed to um, do anything they wanted with their hair, and they were allowed to wear makeup. So when they knew that I was going to take photographs, they didn't quite understand totally how the photographs were going to look. They, a lot of them got made up. And she has this bright turquoise eyeliner, which is actually the most beautiful part of the, it's perfect for the photograph. Um, and this is the book. And I have to just tell you, if you want to write a book, write a book. I am up there in the mountains in Maine. I got, um, I forget now what they all are, outstanding book of the year for that category and then a gold medal for the other one. I mean, who would have thought? So go for it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, so this was this one modality, and these are the two books. Now, another modality is this one. And this one, I had to finally realize, this, this is really about my personal narrative in a, in a different way. Um, my grandfather was an inventor, so I love the idea of artist as inventor. And I really did invent this because I have looked and looked and looked. I can't find anybody using polymer clay like this. But I have to give credit to the Huichol Indians because of Mexico, because they, the yarn paintings, I'm sure, is the source of this thinking. I was trying to come up with a project for my students, and I was thinking about Van Gogh and strokes of clay instead of paint, then realizing that 10-year-olds would not find that interesting. So then I thought about rolling coils, and then that led to this. But I really think that underneath it all were the Weichel. And it's really wonderful for me to know that the Weichel um, have it as a shamanic practice. The people who do those yarn paintings are the shaman, and that it, it's about a transmission of their spirituality. So I really love that double kind of meaning. But this one is called God Body, and again, this is another um, visions and voices. I would have been in big trouble in Europe uh, at the time, burning times, because what happened is I got to the top of the rock that I hike, the, I call it the big rock, and um, I was worried about a partner who was not taking care of himself. And I was sort of obsessing over it for the last couple of weeks. And this voice said, put yourself first, which is heresy for women anyway. And I went, oh, put myself first. And I took this step forward. And this is what I saw in my mind's eye. So I'm like, oh, this is the God body that I wear under my skin. Um, or my higher self, or my soul, or I don't know, you could call it a number of things. But what I've learned since is that she's actually my inner ally. And that will come in in a moment with uh, healing right now, actually. One of the things I've understood about trauma is that we need a resource. The trauma happens that takes us out of balance and overwhelms us, and what we need is a resource to come back to some kind of balance. And if it's a body resource, if it's something you feel in your body, you live alone and you come home and you hold your cat and you feel this incredible connection and warmth, that's a body resource. So a body resource in the transformation of trauma, it's essential to experience something that creates a felt sense. So a felt sense of that thing that is the opposite of the overwhelm of the trauma. It's a calm, it's a good feeling, it's safety. Or it's also just a sense of being supported. When I saw this in my mind's eye, and then I saw it in real life, and they're the size of, the, of an oven, so they're almost, I've actually never stood up next to the piece, I don't know how life size it is, but it's big enough that I feel like it's a being opposite me. And this happens to be a geode. And then there's a crystal right here, which is um, our throat center. Um, and it just, uh, I don't know, I had one friend said, oh, I think it looks like what an orgasm must look like. <laughs> I thought, oh, we're on tape, I guess that's okay. Um, um, and I thought, wow, you know, I hadn't thought of that. But that's another interpretation of that felt sense of support. I just to show you this in terms of the mechanics of how I do it. I draw the picture and then I just roll the coils. And the beautiful thing is, is that it's like mixing paint physically. You can get gradations of color the way you want. And they're sold in these little blocks. 
Um, this is the one that um, I was absolutely thrilled was on the back cover for the um, Maine Hot Women Pioneers show here. I, you know, they've got all those ones to choose from, and it, it, I came into the show, and it was just like it made my month. Um, and again, you know, with having violation to the body through sexual abuse, transforming all of this, and a butterfly being transformation, the snake also, um, just that's the heart. Um, just fusing again. I mean, this is very much like the photographs, only it's just sort of more concrete and I get to build it. I um, went to art school and my painter, painting teacher really wanted me to be a painter. And I really thought about it hard and I really liked him as a teacher and all of that. But I realized that as much as I do kind of like to paint, I like to make things more. I like to build the painting. So what's satisfying about this modality is that it's um, building a painting in a sense. Um, so I don't know if I said this, but uh, those things then become a body resource and that trauma can overwhelm the system and the resources can bring it back into balance. I did say that. Now, what I have found is that when I use the human body with a creative expression, it can create a powerful felt sense, even more so than, for example, this one, which does have a beautiful story behind it. If there's time, we'll go back. Um, because that felt sense then can really become a very real ally. And it's a partnership with the self for healing. Um, I didn't mention that this one is called um, Please Abide With Me, and it's really a prayer. And what I realized in that title is that actually asking your source, asking creator, uh, divinity to abide with you is so human because it, it already is. <laughs> So it, I then think of it as a reminder, just to remind me. Okay, so as I mentioned to somebody um, that you're gonna see some new work that I haven't shown anybody, and um, it's in process. And it does come from, I'm gonna be very vulnerable because it does come from my own life. Um, I spent um, 11 years in what I thought finally with um, Mr. Number Three was it. And given my family of origin and where I started from, I can see why I still didn't get it, but um, I discovered that the 11 years had been um, a deception, that there was a lot of deception. So I went through this process and I made a piece called Hidden in Plain Sight, and it came out of a poem that I wrote. And the poem was, is that the 11 years and the deception was like there was a snake in the basement, slowly removing just one stone very quietly at a time. And it wasn't until it all finally got revealed that I realized that there was no foundation left. So this is just the process of building that. Um, the snake uh, transforms in color. Um, the stones are down here. I um, plant freesias in my greenhouse to get me through Maine winters. And so these are freesias in the soil of the body. And then they come up to the, uh, uh, sort of feels like the lungs and the heart and they bloom and uh, the snake turns to white, and then the tongue of the snake becomes the body of the, of the butterfly. And the uh, background is pretty much the same as what's going on because of that idea of hidden in plain sight. Now, the interesting part of this piece is that when I went to fire it, which is basically just cook it in the oven, I don't know why I did this. I burned it. And so all the beautiful blue and light up here has been colored. Um, the white out here is colored. These guys were translucent um, snakes, so by overcooking it, they became brown. And I know, <laughs> that's what I thought. I had to mow the lawn and I closed the oven. I don't know why I closed the oven because it was still warm and I went out. And you know, my women friends have said, well, you were burned. So maybe this is the metaphor. But what I don't know yet is what to do with that. You know, do I, one impulse was to bring the blue all back and, you know, with paint, you know. But then I, there's a part of me that's saying, it is what it is, you know. And the truth is, I have the photograph of it before it was burned. 
So, but it's just an example of how the art can work the process for you and help you. And also because here I was saying, oh yes, all this hard stuff, and now I'm up in the butterfly and the transformation. And the universe said, no, 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 you want? I'm burning this. Um, so this is a series that I've decided to start. This is also of nobody's seen. Um, and oh my gosh, it's being taped, so now a lot of people will see it. <laughs> And it's on the heart, and it's going to be a whole series on the heart. And it's, I have a brainstorm of three columns. And I've got bleeding heart, and I've got deceived heart and broken heart, and all kinds of pierced heart and diminished heart and all of this. And then I know what's going to happen is it's going to go into hopeful heart and waiting heart and open heart and um, glorious heart and I mean all, all of the rest and a neighbor of mine happens to be a guy who takes gems and works them and he has he stopped me the other day and he said I have all these gems and I can't use them because they have little flaws in them would you like to have like little rubies and you know all these like and I'm like because I'm thinking about doing a cross section of the heart and having all these gems inside and the cross section of the chambers so anyway so this is the first one this is um this one is called A Deceived Heart. And I don't have broken heart filmed yet. OK, so another modality that I use, and um, it's, anybody, okay, it's a half an hour, so I think, I think we're doing OK. Um, another modality is this one that really is successful and is something that all people who work with people could use very easily. Um, this actually happened to be down at UNE at the other campus that I did a workshop. And it's after a guided imagery. It's after the opportunity for the individual to go inside and kind of retrieve either a gesture or a feeling or something that is important at the moment. And then we use the cast shadow and trace them on a big piece of paper. And then they metaphorically fill in what's going on with them inside. And this was out in Washington State with middle school kids just showing her working on it. This is the girl who you saw in the other uh, photograph that I had mentioned that UNE owns. And um, hers in particular had to do with the fact that this is a very articulated, competent hand. And this is the hand, she was really stuck on writing poetry and on art, felt very blocked because she had been with two different men who had forbid her to do that in their um, dominance of her. So she was acknowledging the wiped out incompetent hand and their hiding coming in is the competent hand I thought was brilliant. And I mean, I'm thinking she was 15 at the time, maybe. Um, this was a, a, actually this is the woman that you saw in the fern. Uh, this is an incarcerated woman. And one of the things that I have found useful is to go ahead and bring magazines in but with the complete stipulation that they cannot use words out of the magazines, that they need to only use metaphor and imagery, because it's too easy to go to the words. You know, suffering, pain, blah, 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 blah. And they have to dig much deeper. Now, the other thing I think was really interesting is that she chose to recline also. Um, but she was also someone who said, oh, I'm terrible, I'm not artistic, I don't know how to do this. And, I make agreements with them in the beginning that it's a put down free zone and that means to each other and the self. So I try to make them see that that's not you know, helping. But anyway, what was her key in were these images. They, they, they made sense and that was what uh, was her entry in. Um, this woman was so extraordinary. She had, um, she's in the book uh, and this is her drawing. This woman had been in, I think, 19 years. Um, Yes, be, uh, or something close to that. I don't know, it's, it's in the story. But essentially what happened is she was with her husband and he killed a man and she was terrified as an abused woman to say anything so she got an accessory. And her six-year-old daughter, who um, she got separated from by being incarcerated, no one brought her in. And okay, so six minus 21, so was that like about 15 years? Because her daughter was now 21 and she'd never seen her. And she was within a few weeks of getting out. So her poem that she wrote, her piece of writing was unbelievably powerful. But when I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, those four walls cannot contain this woman. It's just extraordinary. I'm in touch with her now, actually, on Facebook. She's in uh, Seattle taking care of animals. 
This one was a really interesting piece, too, that I just want to say a little bit about. Um, this was a, a young girl who was Native American and African American, and her father was African American. And this is another example of where the magazines were really, really helpful. Because um, she disclosed at school that her father had been abusing her for years, and the school district uh, took her out of the system, and then she did an outdoor thing in uh, Wyoming, and then she was at Copper Canyon Academy. And when she saw this photograph, she said, it looks like my dad. And he is a tumor on my side that is, that is coming out. It's on its way out. And that to me was, um, and this is the flower in her hand. This is what she's moving toward. This is what she's leaving. And there was this beautiful serene picture of water and ocean, and she's looking toward the light. And um, I just thought that was really brilliant. So let's see where we're going next. Ah, so the last modality is this one of casting the body. And again, as I'm saying, um, I'm using the body again, uh, and this time in a very real way. And it's a three-dimensional shot image of you. And what was very sweet about this is this to me brings up, uh, first of all, beauty and the connection to nature, which is our source. Both of those can create value. So I had a perfect example of this at the Omega Institute. There was a woman signed up for the breastplate class and she was very nervous because she said, I'm not artistic, I'm a, I'm a librarian. She said, I'm not creative and I'm really afraid if I could do this. And I said, well, you don't really have anything to do because we're just gonna cast your body. So when the casting came off of her body, she turned around and she went, oh my God, it's a work of art. Oh. And then she went, I'm a work of art. And it was just that beautiful, simple message that really, really worked well. Anyway, this is a really powerful modality as well. And this young man um, was a great model. And, and that's a, obviously a larger casting. And this is just a fragment of his piece and what he did to it. Um, this is when I went down to North Carolina working with women with breast cancer. This is a mastectomy survivor. That's an incredibly powerful thing to do. And um, those women are so brave and so fearless and just so astounding. Um, um, Peggy Greenhut gave me a show twice of the women um, who had done these breastplates. And their family members, in many cases, had a harder time going to the show than the women who actually made them. I mean, it just is something incredible. Here's another one. So I've used it myself as well. Um, this is a full body cast that I did, um, and it's called Unconditional Joy. And it was after I ended a chapter uh, and spent a year in mourning for Mr. Challenge number two. Um, <laughs> I um, suddenly started to feel free and light. I didn't know there was a, th a number three coming, but. Um, and I experienced this sense of joy that I was never going to go back to some of the other patterns that I'd had earlier. And it was this sense of just unconditional joy. And also what's important in this piece, uh, that's the inside of the piece. And I was um, completely fantasizing about um, Goldsworthy and Andy Goldsworthy. So I have images of Andy Goldsworthy in different places. Um, but the part that's really important is that little, um, sea urchin there's a picture of me when I was about three in total joy because obviously it wasn't all bad there were moments of joy I wouldn't know joy um, so this is another one this is called gratitude and it's sort of the important thing about this one was it helped me to see what what prayer and a connection to a higher power a divine entity look like because it's so, and I couldn't even use the word prayer for most of my adult life, so um, it, it really helped concretize that. And that's really the beauty of art, is it's a physical thing. And also, also the thing about the castings is because it's you and you're carrying you around, it's like you're sanding you and you're painting. I mean, it's a very intimate and interesting relationship because it is you, but it isn't you, but it, it puts you outside of yourself and issues that you might have you have a capacity to deal with because they're outside. One great story about that, I'll just tell quickly. I had a couple's uh, mask making, and a couple, a married couple came in, and um, we did a guided imagery, and the woman burst into tears and ran out. 
And she said, I can't do this. I'm not doing this class. And I went out and I just asked, you know, what was it? And she said, um, we lost our son. And he was nine years old or something. And um, it's just too painful. And I said, I, I understand. And I don't understand. But I am in complete empathy. And I said, this might be a chance to work through that. You're in a safe place. You know, so she stayed and she did a mask that was her head and her neck and her shoulders. So I see her cutting it and peeling it open and putting layers and making this huge gash, this big, 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 big wound. And I went by and she said, yes, that's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. And then the next session I went and it was gone. And I, I said, oh, it's gone. And she said, you know, I just needed to see it. And I just needed to see it. And I don't need to see it anymore. Now I know. And I'm like, I was like, yeah. I, I mean, it's such a great example, again, of the power of the external piece that's outside of you. It is you, but it's outside of you. And it gives you that opportunity. So um, our self-perception impacts our immune system, which we all know. Um, and recovery, one of the things I've kind of gleaned out of recovery is that I took the fire out of the pain and I turned it into fuel. And then you can use that fuel to be creative. It's really a win-win. And um, that gets back to renegotiating the trauma, reframing the trauma. So lastly, art can also draw attention to social issues and issues of justice, which is really awesome. Um, Many examples of this are turning up, especially now that we have greater media fluency and all people can do films and things like that with iPhones. But I first saw this with Eve Ensler's work in the Vagina Monologues. Um, that, and that has started, if you are a fan of hers, that started a complete worldwide movement for social change. And it was out of a, a theater piece of these women acting out these parts. Um, so I've been working for the Truth and Reconciliation um, I don't know what others, oh yes, this is the burning off, she's right there actually. Um, this is more stories. Um, I just want to show you that for the difference of photography. It's the same piece, but um, this was in 2000 when I was turning 50, had really bad hot flashes. My son was graduating and leaving home. I broke up with Mr. Challenge number two and he took the dog and suddenly I was in an empty house and it was intense. <laughs> And so I did this mask to burn off the part that no longer served me. And um, yeah, it was just in a show here. And this is my friend midwife giving birth to herself. So these are more examples of um, casting. OK, this is what I wanted to talk to you about. Because um, as you may know, I hope you know, that Maine is the first state in the country to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission over the issues of what happened to Native children. And um, I started as a volunteer for a year and a half. And um, then last summer, I became part-time community engagement coordinator. And um, this work has changed my consciousness in a big way and has impacted my community also. But one of the things that I found out from a young man who is in a student, that his brother is using photography to ch for social change. And he hasn't done this yet, but he agreed with me that he would make a mock-up. And what it does is it brings up the conversation. And this is the boarding school, the famous boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that many Penobscot, because they would be the first uh, Aboriginal nation you would come to as you came north. So the names in the PowerPoint that we give are so many familiar names from the Penobscot nation. Maliseet Micmac and um, Passamaquoddy that were more northern went to uh, Shubanagadi, which is a school up in Nova Scotia. Um, but the, the chilling impact of this is what the legacy of what we're uh, trying to help heal in the truth and reconciliation. So I was really thrilled that he, through his brother and his brother being involved, because his brother and her, his professor are studying our truth and reconciliation as it is the first one in the world and like this and the first one in the United States. And um, so he, and then here's an, oops. Here's another example of Max, Max Collins. And I thought I would just let you know his website, Max Collins Photography, just because he's such an interesting guy in terms of what he's doing. And just to be thinking that way, I thought was really, really awesome. Um, the thing that I also wanted to mention to you is that um, the, and I can't remember what slide I have next. 
Oh, yeah. Um, the thing about this is I did want to mention intergenerational trauma. And it was a concept I kind of knew about because my parents, who both were my perpetrators, had both been victims. And their whoever in the generation above them had perpetrated them. And I know that my family history of that abuse was multi-generational. But when you look at Aboriginal culture and you look at the intense destruction of the ways of being. Ways of being and knowing is the epistemology of a culture. And the term epistemicide, I first heard from Rebecca Sockbeeson in one of the UNE talks, mentioned that idea of the destruction of the ways of being. And I learned a, a little tiny fraction more of what that means when I heard uh, that in Wabanaki language, there's no word for rights. There's absolutely no word for rights. The closest thing they have is responsibilities. So imagine the difference in a culture where the language doesn't even have that word. So you can see that the destruction of the language as part of the epistemology is so profound. Not to mention that anyone who has a child or a nephew or a niece and you thought of anyone taking that, taking that child from you, what that would do. And then that happened again, and then that happened again, and it happened again. So that intergenerational trauma of losing in native culture, I mean, I could say for every culture, children are important, but I, I, I experienced such depth of the value of children. There's a, a very um, universal, not that every native person is exactly the same, for sure, but there is a, an attitude, a belief, that there are three parents for every child. There's the mother, the father, and the rest of the tribe. And some of our social workers misunderstood kinder care because they would spend a few days at Auntie and then they'd go to Grandma and then they'd go. There's a different kind of um, consciousness around uh, children. So um, the impact that this is the man who did the famous Kill the Indian to Save the Man and he's also the one who set up the Indian Carlisle School industrial school. These photographs, I think, are really important to know because they were used as justification. Um, these were the before and these were the after. And there's this idea of epistemology, ways of knowing, ways of being. Uh, I think this is also a very chilling example of the beauty, the intensity, the imagination, the fire, the life, and the deadening. It's just profound. So I want to tell you the impact of the positive aspect of change of consciousness of the truth and reconciliation in my own community. Um, we had a tradition in Bethel of um, celebrating a native woman named Molly Ockett. And the way we celebrated her for 55 years was to dress a white girl up in an Indian costume and ride in a convertible and wave to the crowd. And um, we have a really brilliant uh, head of the chamber and two, Three years ago now, she um, realized in taking over this festival that we needed a native presence. So she'd invited Barry Dana, former chief of the Penobscot, uh, some drummers and the Verna Wolfskag drummers, and some other basket practitioners. So I'm standing with Barry Dana as the parade goes by and Miss Maliaki. And my heart sank, and I was just um, so apologetic. And he's like, oh my god, I feel like I'm in a movie. And then um, a flatbed of the parade came by and the theme that year in an effort to be inclusive about native culture was the life and times of Maliakit. And it was these high school kids who were all thespians because I know them and they were dressed up, war paint, bare chested, tomahawks, hooping and hollering and I'm standing with Barry. So I wrote a letter to the paper and I just said had that been a float of African Americans with blackface and eating watermelon and banjos, we would have all understood in a second. But our appropriation of native culture is so replete that we don't even get it. And I asked the chamber if we could change, and actually I want to give credit to Barry because Barry said, how did she get to be Miss Maliaki? And I said, well, it's very simple. I mean, they, sometimes they write a little paragraph or something, but it's kind of political probably, I don't know. And he said, well, why isn't it just then the essay winner? Or the, you know, pair? and I said, I thought, yes, that's what it needs to be. So in one year's time, I asked if we could replace her. And they said yes. And we replaced her with 
the essay winners. And so we value speaking up, we value writing, we value academia, and we don't value pretending to be in a pageant. <laughs> Which many people in town are so grateful for, and many people are very, um, I don't know how many, but there's grumbling that we got rid of Miss Maliaki. So I was going to do the poster for that year that we got the first year we're going to get rid of Miss Maliaket. And I knew that there was a way I wanted to include Wabanaki culture, but I knew that I was not going to do that alone. So I contacted James Francis, who's the cultural historian of the Penobscot Nation. Went three and a half hours up there, knocked on his door. He didn't know how far I'd come, and he forgot. And he looked at me and he went, oh, yeah, 9 o'clock Friday. Well, I got an appointment with an elder. So very quickly, um, he showed me this. And I said, can I collaborate with you and take the um, top of that? And then I asked him if we could use the four symbols of the four tribes. And then um, because in Celtic tradition, there is a tradition of the four directions, as there is in native culture, that the four directions. And um, this is actually Second Island off of uh, Sibayak, the the reservation up there. So if you're from Sibayak, you would recognize that. And the north was a night sky, midday. And this is my view in western Maine. That's um, Ajilchuk, which is better known to white people as Mount Washington. And then I added color. And that was the poster that we collaborated on. And the poster this year we collaborated on as well. And it just doesn't have some of his drawing. But he totally collaborated on with the theme of it, which was homecoming. So we're trying to bring it back to um, the original idea of what homecoming. Then the other thing that has happened that is very exciting is um, one day I got the idea of, I thought of Robert's work. I just um, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, oh my god, wouldn't it be amazing if he were to paint these major I call them the core architects. It's Denise Altfader and Esther Atien. And I just think they are the heart of the truth and reconciliation. And I didn't know he was a Mainer. And I called and he answered and he, we led to a conversation and then I met him and, then, and so he did, he painted them. And these were um, unveiled in the Hall of Flags at the Capitol. And there was a social worker there who came and at the end in the question and answer she stood up she had a cane, and she said, um, I'm one of the social workers who took the children, and I came here to ask for forgiveness. And Denise went up and put her arms around her and held her and kissed her on the cheek and kissed her on the forehead. They put their foreheads together and just sobbed. And it was just, it's beautifully written up by Robert, and it was in the um, Sun Journal, and also in Indian Country Today, you can look that article up too, because he worded it so beautiful in terms of what it meant. Um, I just want to read her quote, and that was it, and we have 10 minutes. Um, For Native people, forced assimilation and acculturation distort our thoughts, feelings, and actions, creating a disconnect with our identity and traditions. We start to believe that there is something wrong with us. The truth is, our resilient strength, humor, and intelligence have saved us from extinction, will enable us to heal from generational trauma, and will restore our cultures so that we may thrive as distinct, unique, beautiful people the Creator meant for us to be. So, sorry. Um, it's hard not to be so moved by that. Um, so, <clears throat> um, can I ask you to take your papers out? Um, and this is where my assistants need to come in to help. Just um, look at those four papers and think of one that you'd be willing to give Kate or um, Kathleen. Get it right? Kathleen. Kathleen, I'm sorry. <laughs> just, just pick up one that you'll be willing to give her, and then you guys just walk around and get them for me, please. Well, I can do it, too. Okay. So you're just giving up one of those to me. Okay. You pick one that you can give up. Okay, and then if you can in your in your um, lap, can you lay the other three out? Okay, the three of us are going to come around, and we're going to take um, we're going to take some.
Okay. Um, just want to, is anybody having a feeling they can express? A feeling of valuable things being taken away from us. Yeah, can you, can you describe what that? Uh, well, you can see me sitting here covering my most vulnerable part with my forearms. <laughs> from yeah. No more, no more. Yeah. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of what many generations of taking. We call the people who come to hear the statements statement gatherers because statement taker is too harsh a word in that community. So in the remaining 10 minutes, I just really want to have a chance for you to respond, to ask questions, to get clarifications. Uh, I ran a little longer than I meant to, but I think there's enough time. Yeah, we have a mic so that it can go on the... If we kept going with that, we would have kept taking them until you had nothing left. But I think you got the feeling. Yeah. Um, I was just curious if you're using artwork with um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission That's process. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, from the very start, knowing that many authors, artists, poets, musicians have come into Native community taken what they wanted and left and made money on it and left the communities in the same condition. I made it really, really clear from the very beginning that I was here to sit down, shut up and listen and serve. And my skill set as a teacher has been, an organizer has been the main, and my mouth, I'm an extrovert, so that helps to, you know, like what's happened in my town and writing letters and that kind of thing. That said, um, there was a, radio show called Wabanaki Windows that Donna Loring runs and I was asked to be on by Esther Atian and Donna had looked at my website and seen the art and healing work and she asked me the same question and I said what I might imagine is when the non-native community comes forward to tell their story perhaps I could be of use in helping process some of that and to that amazingly Donna said Native people are very creative people. I would hope that you would extend your experience and skills to work with them. Now, what that might mean is somewhere way down the road, because right now the process is so tender. There's been a tradition of not speaking up to survive. So just to speak up is then really hard. So I would love to think in the future that I would have the incredible honor to facilitate a group of Wabanaki people who are wanting to um, move in another way to healing. Yeah. Time will tell. So, any clarification about that um, reframing trauma? That's kind of what I'm curious about. As I'm guessing with social workers and, you know, this school, that that's really the job is to really externalize it, first of all, to see it. And that's like that woman who saw the wound. Um, and then to, to have some way to find that felt sense of the part that is the um, balance to that overwhelm, to that trauma. And I think beauty and nature are just, that's what's worked for me. Yeah. And as you can see, it's still, part of my path. You know, it's not over until it's over. I thought I was finished and I've now been given a whole new um, opportunity to um, work through a broken heart in another way and um, heal that heart. And I think it will really happen by creating these, these uh, stages and these transformations. And then a friend of ours, Rosie, um, said that she sees it as a book and that it could be really helpful people. Any um, experience, emotional experience that could help me when I talk about this to other people? I've, I saw some of you be pretty moved at times. Does anybody want to share that, like what that was or what came up? Yeah. I just say I really I would just say I really admire the way that you um, talk about the heartbreak as an opportunity to learn something, or it, you know, like that's something we could all learn how to do better. 
Yeah. And, and so you're modeling for the young women that you're working with, like this is something that we can use to learn, we use as the fuel, I think you, yeah. you, know, you transform it and, and you do that even in your conversation and I just really appreciate your ability to do that, it's remarkable. Yeah. And, and um, so my work has been with women who are healing from domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And I really use a lot of creativity and, and expression too. I really resonated with your work because um, through recognition, right? I saw the way in which you can put that heartbreak and that trauma out where it can be looked at. And, and it becomes a validation of that experience for women who, when it's left to rumble around inside of us, often second guess it, or he really wasn't that bad, or you know maybe I just deserved it. So mm -hmm. to be able to externalize it, create it, look at it, and work it through in a, in a way that's you know manageable yeah. such an important part of healing yeah. so i just yeah. thank you so much yeah. for your work and for your presence and and for you moving us along this awareness of of the ways in which we we do heal through that creative expression and that connection to the divine yeah yeah and that's tricky because you know you want to respect everybody's path and for you know not everyone it, it it's god and it hasn't, you know, there's lots of definitions and lots of ways to perceive that as well. But you're right, it's that left brain matrix we were talking about that can create this rationale that you have to break through. I can't remember if the, the one piece about the uh, frontal lobe shutting down when people who've experienced trauma, I think I skipped that. Um, one of the other pieces of evidence was that when trauma survivors try to talk about the uh, trauma, the frontal lobe communication shuts down and the amygdala and the right brain light up and the amygdala being the seat of emotion. So it really is that avenue in and through the creativity and imagery. And if you think about it, we were imagery sensitive long before we had language. We, as beings on this planet, we had to be very sensitive to our environment to survive. So visuals can be really, really more brainstem, more primary, I think. Yeah. Um, I was actually just wondering if you could give us some names maybe for further reading, especially on what you were just speaking about. Um, yeah, it's in my, um, it's in my forward of some of the books. Um, okay, I can look there. <laughs> uh, yeah, names, oh, I'm 64 almost. Uh, some of you can relate that names are like, um, Sean McNiff, okay, he, he re actually wrote the forward to one of them, is an amazing man who's, um, dealt with art and healing for a really long time. But you have, I have to say, I'm, um, my last name Patch means the fool, and I kind of have that childlike fool through life. I'm not really heavily academic. I don't really look to other people. I more go by my own experience and intuition. Mm -hmm. So I might run into people, and I'll think as I'm driving away, oh, I could have said, you know. Um, but. Uh, there are some references, like obviously the research that I got, um, Doris Pronevsky, Harring Arrington, and some of the, there's a man who's written a great book about um, nature deficit disorder. Um, you know, there's things like that. But if you, it, even just starting with Sean McNeff, mm -hmm. he's awesome body of work. He was with Leslie Carlton. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else or should we end here? Well, thank you so much, everybody for letting me share this. It's a treat for me too, you know.